Hi everyone, my name is Uduwe Dukesagi. I'm a senior data scientist at Depop. Um, so I work in the trust and safety team, working on you know um, machine learning models for user behavior and content moderation. Um, and today I wanted to talk about text classification using um, transfer learning and deep transformers. Um, so to start with, I'm going to kind of dig a little bit into transfer learning and sort of give you know some overview about what that is. So to talk about transfer learning, we first need to think about deep learning, um, which is really quickly becoming a key instrument in, in ML and AI. Um, so what is deep learning? Deep learning is basically, it basically refers to any um, algorithm or method that uses neural networks with more than, with, with three or more layers. So um, what we typically find is that a lot of um, <clears throat> modern networks are quite deep and, 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 and dense. And these are really the networks that are pushing the field further and further um, in advance. And one of the biggest boosts offered really is, has been seen in image classification. So computer vision, image recognition, and that's been through the use of CNNs. <clears throat> so how it works here um, is the state of the art CNNs are actually like really large and really expensive. And they require loads of data, loads of resources, loads of time to train. Um, like one example is the ImageNet ILS VRC model, which is trained on 1.2 million labeled images. That means someone has to, by some means, literally 1 million images, images need to be labeled and marked and trained. And the training takes around two to three weeks on multiple GPUs. And not everyone even has multiple GPUs. So on a CPU, imagine how long that would take. That would literally you'd be looking at months. So basically, deep learning is pushing the boundaries of, of machine learning, but it's honestly not that accessible. It's not, not everyone can do this. Um, it's very expensive and not everyone has the resources for it. And so enter transfer learning. Transfer learning is trying to basically stand on the shoulders of giants. It's kind of like the green initiative of machine learning, it's trying to reuse what we've already got instead of building afresh every, every single time. <clears throat> so in terms of image recognition, these are usually based on um, large existing convolution, convolutional neural networks of CNNs. Like one example would be the ImageNet one I shared in the previous slide. Um, and CNNs are actually a special kind of neural network that are based on the visual cortex, the human visual cortex, which is kind of like the human system of vision. Um, so it has while neural networks, normal vanilla neural networks typically just have, you know, dense, fully connected layers. Um, CNNs have convol convolutional layers, which sort of perform convolving operations on the inputs. And then the outputs of the convolving operations are then pulled in po pooling layers and then fed to fully, fully connected dense layer. And so they're kind of made up of two parts, the convolutional base and the classifier. The convolutional base is what I described with the convolutional layers and pooling layers, and that's responsible for generating features. So in classical machine learning, we typically have stages of feature engineering, feature selection, um, feature generation, but with CNNs and a lot of deep learning algorithms really, you just feed in the raw input and it learns the features from the raw inputs. That's kind of one of the main you know, powers of deep learning. So the first part is that convolutional base that generates the features. And then the next part is the classifier. So it could be literally anything. It could be, like I said, fully connected layers. It could be a linear SVM. So it's just some classifier that works on, on, on the features. And one thing to note here is that the features are actually generated in a hierarchical manner. Um, so what does that mean? Um, there's kind of a hierarchy to the features. So like the features in the first layer, um, or in the initial layers kind of are general. So I think in, in, in the context of image recognition, you can think of it as just kind of learning about lines and dots and curves. So it's very general. Um, the deeper you go, the more specific we get. So if, 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 we, if we think of the example of a classifier to recognize cats versus, cats versus dogs, the initial layers are just like lines and shapes. And the deeper you go, it starts to recognize things like whiskers, which are, you know, stacks of lines or a particular shape, which is like ears, um, which is obviously more specific to the problem of cats versus dogs. Um, so there's this quote 
if firstly it features a general and lastly it features a specific, then there must be a transition from general to specific somewhere in the network. And that's basically what transfer learning is trying to do. There's a sweet spot in there between the general and the specific. And we're trying to take the general bits that we can use without while leaving behind the more specific bits that are not of, as of use to us. So basically, broadly speaking, there are three kind of strategies to go for um, transfer learning. Um, the first is quite an extreme or one of the extreme ends of it is to just retrain the entire model. It's kind of like it's hardly even transfer learning. It's only transfer learning in the sense that you're reusing the architecture. So it would be like me taking the code used by the ImageNet model and just applying my own data to the code. It would still take, because the model is very large, it would still take three weeks to train on several GPUs. But at least I don't have to go through the trouble of building it myself. Um, the next kind of strategy is to train some of the layers in, in the model and free some of the layers. So leave some of the layers as they are and then only work on, say, however many of the general layers I want in the specific layers. Um, and then the other extreme of it is to freeze all of it and just take the model that was already trained and don't actually do any retraining, just use it to generate features. Um, so there's A and C are kind of the two extremes of it and B is um, where everything all the rest sit really. And so obviously with these kind of strategies, we have to think about which one we're going to use. And the main two things that sort of factor into that are the size of the data set and the similarity of the task we're doing currently to the task the reference model was trained on. So for example, say that ImageNet model was trained on recognizing 1,000 everyday objects. And I now want to say recognize candles that could work because it already knows how to tell objects from each other and candles are an object. But if I was trying to use that same image, image net model that's used for recognizing objects to now recognize cancerous cells, there's not a lot of overlap there. That's going to be a tricky one. Um, so one way to sort of visualize it is with this sort of matrix. I realize there's a lot of information on the slides, so I'll let you um, just look at it for a little bit. So on the right, we have four quadrants, which sort of show the different ways, the different strategies of transfer learning. So the, the top left corner is, you know, the strategy A, where you just retrain the entire model. And top right corner, we see um, retraining, say, the bottom bits of the model and freezing most of the general layers. And bottom left, we're seeing the opposite of that. So freezing most of the, um, the initial bits and, and retraining the specific bits. And bottom right, we're seeing uh, the sort of other extreme, which is just freezing all of it and reusing it and basically just using it as a feature generator. And on the left, you sort of see the scenarios or the factors which correlates to using that. So if, you're, if you have a large data set that's very different from the pre-trained models data sets, then you use you know, top left because so an example of that scenario would be one I described where you're in an original model that's trained to detect objects, but now you want to detect cancerous cells. That's not going to work. But if you have enough images of cancerous cells, you might as well just make your own cancerous cell detector. Um, and so it's kind of like this kind of shows the different um, criteria that correlate to the different strategies, which I think is quite useful. So that's it, um, and that's pretty much transfer learning in terms of images. Next, I'm going to talk about um, specifically transformers, which are bringing it from image recognition to text classification. But before I go, and I just want to break for questions, if anyone's got any questions. Hey, Adua. So if you open the Q and A, there's a couple of questions come in. Uh, and also a comment about it being a great slide with the four quadrants. Um, in terms of those questions, it's probably easier just if you pick the most relevant ones and just read them yourself, read them out loud uh, and answer them rather than me coming back uh, between each one. Is that all right? Yeah, oh, no, there is. Sorry, the Q&A open. We've got a couple there from uh, Manny um, yeah. and obviously Raphael was commenting. So if you answer the ones that, you know, that it may be that you can't get through all of them, pick the ones that are most relevant and then carry on with the rest of the talk. Awesome. 
So um, Manu's question, when we train some layers and leave some and leave others frozen, is it always the last in first out order? Are we picking random layers in the middle and then layers? Honestly, it's completely up to you. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, the initial layers learn more general features. So just kind of the most broadly applicable features that would, um, someone's asking to show the last slide, so I'll just do that. Um, so yeah, the, the initial layers learn the most gen like generic features, whereas the final layers learn more specific features. So it, it's kind of depends on what you want. Um, so, you know, you can pick, you know, to only to freeze the first five layers, you can pick to freeze from the first to the last, you can, yeah, basically it's sort of up to you. Um, when you say small data set, what order of ma magnitude are we talking about here? Well, it kind of varies. Um, with image recognition, I would say a data set that's less than a thousand images per class is a small data set. Um, with text classification, probably about the same thing, to be honest. Um, the, bottom, the bottom left and top quadrants on the right have the same text. Are they actually the same approach? Yes. Um, the bottom left and top quadrants. I don't think they do have the same text, to be honest. But I think someone must have misread that. What kind of hacks would you use to label many millions of images or data points? Um, I would use sort of crowdsourced, um, crowdsourced labeling. So kind of gamifying it and making it a game um, and sort of sharing that you know, with loads of people and Say if you know, say if I have ten thousand images, and if I have ten thousand people, each of those ten thousand people really only has to answer one question, which you know it takes them one second to do. So that's kind of like I think the hack, and also what I suspect a lot of Google captures are doing. You know, those things where you have to like they say click, you know, the road to prove that you're a human. I suspect that's probably what they're doing. Um, so I'm just going to move on now to. The next slide. So to start with, what is a transformer? Um, a transformer is actually a special kind of neural network that's made up of two, two parts, two little, well, two big networks, um, an encoder and a decoder. Um, the encoder kind of takes the inputs and transforms it to some hidden representation. It takes the inputs and makes it into a vector. And then the vector is passed to the decoder, which then either tries, tries to, from that vector representation, get some new representation. <clears throat> and if that doesn't make sense, um, this might help make it clear. They were kind of the pioneering algorithm for machine translation. So imagine you're trying to go from English to French. So the input is in English. Um, the encoder puts that in a vector of numbers. You then put those numbers into the decoder and the decoder then generates French from it. So it's kind of um, yeah, a sequence, sequence kind of uh, model. But they take a different route to the traditional recurrent um, models in that they, instead of recurrence, so you know, each inputs depending on the previous inputs as well as the current inputs, they kind of use attention and attend to all of the inputs at the same time. So that kind of looks a little bit like this. Excuse me. Um, so in the top there, we, we, you can see that um, you know it's going kind of in sequence from left to right. The inputs are being fed this way, so you start with lets, and then that's fed in here, and that's you know so good thinks about lets and two good things about go, and Mars thinks about everything else that's come behind. It's kind of in sequence in that way, going from left to right. Whereas with transformers on the bottom, everything is fed in at once, and the model at different steps chooses what to attend to. So it chooses what to pay attention to and what to ignore. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like one of the powerful differences. And the transformer we're going to be talking about today is the sort of archetypical transformer described in the like um, pioneering paper, attention is all you need. So this, this like I said, is made up of two, two parts, an encoder and a decoder. The encoder is actually made up of N layers. N is in the archetypical transformer and is set to six. Um, and each of the six layers is actually made up of two sub layers. Um, so the sub layer is basically an attention mechanism and then a fully connected neural network, just a regular neural network. 
and the, so some input is fed into a layer and then it goes into the sub layer, which is the attention mechanism, the fully connected network. And then at the end of that layer, some something called layer normalization is applied. Um, layer normalization is kind of building on batch normalization, which if we're not fam familiar with, is a technique used to, to prevent or, or reduce this phenomenon called internal covariate shift, um, which is a scary sounding term, but it's actually quite simple. Um, so when we think about neural networks and training, we have, we have several layers and the layers, the values in the layers are changing at each step all the time. So what that actually looks in practice, let's say we have five layers. In the first layer, we're dealing with numbers that are in, di in the distribution, say between one and 10. So it's just numbers between one and 10. But for some reason, because of the way the network is set up, in layer five, we're dealing with numbers that are between 0 0.1 and 0 0.8. It's hard to, so the numbers are shifting all the time. So it's hard to kind of like nail it down. It's kind of like an endless, you know, going in cycles. And what this does really is just it makes training longer and it takes longer for the weights to converge. And so what batch normalization is doing is just normalizing the values at each layer to say, every input I get must be between one and 10 or must be between something. So it's basically just normalizing based on the mean and the um, variance. So because all of the layers will always be have the same distribution, it converges really quick. So it's basically just a hack. It doesn't improve performance. It's just a hack that imp improves the amount of time it takes to train. Um, and so that's kind of useful here because um, transformers are quite deep and any help we can get reducing the time is welcome. So following from that is then, is then the decoder. So similar to the encoder, it's made up of n layers, which is also set to six. Um, but the difference here is that the decoder now has, for each layer in the decoder, we have three sub layers. <clears throat> so we have an initial attention mechanism, which is just um, applied to the output of the decoder. And then we have the decoder's own attention mechanism, similar to the one the encoder had, and then the fully connected net network. And again, um, layer normalization is applied to make to speed up convergence. Um, and then once we do all of this, our outputs are fed to a linear, linear classifier. So it could be, again, it could be pretty much anything, a fully connected neural network, it could be linear SVM, to be honest, it could probably be naive based, um, doesn't really matter at this point. So yeah, that's, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, that's pretty much um, transformers. We need to break again for questions if, if anyone has any. <coughs> um, so Manu's asking, when you say normalization, is something the distribution between, uh, let's check the slide again, set in the distribution between minus one and one for each batch. Would standardization help in such cases instead of normalization? Um, so standardization and normalization are actually different things, even though they're kind of mixed up. Um, they're actually quite different. So standardization is basically saying you want something to lie between this range. Normalization actually takes into the, takes into account the distribution of the values. So normalization typically has a formula, something like um, the value minus the mean divided by the variance. So you're actually taking in the properties of, of, of the data, the actual distributional properties of the data. Whereas with standardization, you could just be saying divide everything by 10 and that's how you standardize. Um, so it's actually slightly different. Um, it, is, it has to be normalization because we want to preserve the distributional statistics. Um, yeah. Is it possible for the transformer architecture to be bi-directional? If so, can you, if so, please can you explain why this could be useful? It's actually interesting that you mentioned that because we're about to talk about FATS, which stands for bi-directional encoder networks or something. Um, so, that's actually what BERT is. The next thing we need to talk about um, is a kind of transformer that introduces bi-directionality to, to transformers. So it is possible and it is preferred. All right. So yeah, um, BERT, which stands for bi-directional encoder representations from transformers. Um, so I'm just going to talk about the architecture to start with. Um, oh, sorry. So to start with, um, BERT uses only the encoder 
So you know how transformers are made of encoders and decoders, but only uses the encoders. And this makes it what is known as an auto-encoding transformer, um, which basically means it takes some input and it encodes it to a vector representation, which can then be used downstream. You know, it's basically a feature generator. Um, there are other kinds of transformers. For example, we have what is called autoregressive transformers. And those are similar to recurrent neural networks in that they kind of take things in order in steps. So, you know, it goes A, B, C, you know, left to right. And these transformers are typically used for text generation. So some of you might have heard of um, GPT, which is a language, you know, a text generation model. Um, so GPT giving some prompt will then like sequentially generate new words in the sequence. And that's that's an example of an autoregressive transformer. But we're not really concerned with that here because we're talking about autoencoding. So the standard architecture is basically pretty simple. So it's 12 transformer layers. So that's 12 layers with each transformer layer, which is an encoder, which has six layers. So in total, we're looking at 72 layers. Um, the hidden vector size is 768. And it in total has around 110 million trainable parameters. So it's a fairly, fairly big boy. It's a pretty big model. Um, so now that we you know, know the architecture of it, let's think about how it's actually trained or how, you know, how we build a BERT model. What's the algorithm for it? Um, so BERT is actually trained on a mask language modeling task. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, you know, if you've got different kinds of, of language models, like the autoregressive ones that are trying to, you know, given the previ previous, giving it a bit of text, generate some new texts. Um, that's kind of the common task that people use for training language models. But BERT uses a mask language modeling task, which basically means you give it an input and you hide some of the inputs, and then you ask it to generate or you ask it to tell you what the inputs, the hidden inputs are. So you're basically saying, you know, you fill, fill in the blanks is basically what you're asking it to. So you cross out some things in the input and then you ask but to regenerate the inputs without the things crossed out with it filled in. Um, and so, like I said earlier, there's two kinds of language models, the regressive language models and the permutative language models. And BERT is a permutative language models. Um, we need to explain it on the next slide. So this is kind of what that looks like in practice. So the regressive language models, like I mentioned earlier, like the GPTs and the RNNs, they go in order and sequence. So you're going from left to right. So given the word I, you want to predict that the next what the next word would be, which should be like. And then given the word like, you want the model to predict that the next word should be cats. And you're trying to like give in some previous prior input, predict what the next um, item in the sequence would be. So that's typical regressive language model. A permutative language model doesn't take order into account. So it's just saying, you know, these are some words. What words do you think should be in position five? Or these, these are like words zero, three, and six. What words do you think should be in position two and four? And it's just kind of like, you know, a random shuffling. And this permutation is actually what gives BERT its bidirectional nature because it's not going left to right. It's not going right to left. It's doing it all at the same time. So that's where it gets the bidirectional from. So back to, to the actual training. So we have these inputs, right? But obviously we need to represent these words like I like cats in a format that the computer can understand. So we first need to tokenize the input sentences into, into, in, into like um, individual tokens. And the way we do that is using word piece embeddings. Um, and word piece embeddings basically allow for a special kind of tokenization that splits words into the constituent pieces. So I'm just going to go over an example here. Given the input sequence, he eats strawberries. You know, we would split that into individual words, like he eats and strawberries. But word piece embeddings or word piece tokenization takes that further step by splitting the word strawberries into straw and berries. And basically the whole point of this is so that we use less memory. And because when you think about it, we only have to store we have this, this means we have to store fewer tokens in our dictionary, in our vocabulary, because we don't have to store strawberries and blueberries and, and blackberries, and also the words black and straw and blue and berries. We just have to st store straw and berries or blue and berries. So it reduces um, the amount of memory we use. 
and it also prevents or minimizes the risk of going out of vocabulary. Um, and what I mean by out of vocabulary is, say we've trained a model on a data set um, and it's seen, you know, it's a pretty big data set, but it's seen a million words, but it hasn't seen the word hair for, for some reason, or maybe that's a poor example. It hasn't seen the word blueberries, but it happens to have seen the word blue and berries. So from that, it can piece together that blue is made up of blue and berries, even though blue, the word blueberries never existed once in the data set. In a typical tokenization, what would happen is you would go out of vocabulary. Your model would say, I've never seen that word before. I don't know what to do. But with this, it can sort of piece things together and figure, figure it out. So really, there's honestly no downsides. So um, after this tokenization is done, we then need to add special tokens um, the special tokens for, for birds. The first, there's two of them, CLS and SEP. Um, so the first token, CLS, is prepended to the sequence. So it's added to the front of the sequence. And then SEP is added to the back of the sequence. So in the example of he eats strawberries, that becomes CLS, he eats strawberries, and then SEP. Now, what are these tokens actually for? So the CLS token is actually used um, to represents the hidden representation of the hidden vector that correlates with what you would use to classify. So first of all, I should say that BERTS um, has the capability of taking in more than one sentence. So yeah, it can be used for single, single sequence tasks like text classification, but it can also be used for things that take in two, two pieces of text like, or more than two really. Um, like question answering. So you give it a question and an answer and it's meant to learn the, the, the pattern between that. And SEP is basically saying this is the end of the first sequence and the second sequence is going to start after SEP. And so whereas CLS is basically just saying if you want, if you want to represent this whole piece of text and put it in a classifier, there's no point in looking at he or eats or strawberries. Just look at, just take the representation that correlates with CLS and that should give you what you can use for a classifier. So it's kind of like a, a shortcut feature generator. So if you train with CLS, you get um, classification features for free. Whereas SEP just lets you know where your boundaries are. And as well, you can use SEP as a feature description of the text as well, but CLS is preferred for classification problems. Um, that's pretty much it for this. I'm going to stop now. Before we go into the practical and actually trying to build our own BERT, I'm going to stop um, one more time and, and ask, ask for questions again. So someone's asking, is the piece tokenizer, tokenizer splitting the words by number of syllables, splitting each syllable? So no, it's actually not trying to do that. It's, it's trying to split in terms of subwords. Um, so words that are kind of can be seen of words that can be seen to be made up of multiple words like um, gentleman is made up of the word gentle and man or so it's kind of like splitting compound words into their constituent words as opposed to um, syllable. There are some there's some embeddings that will do that split at each syllable. Um, so that's also possible and doable. Um, but Bert specifically uses word piece tokenization, but there's nothing stopping you from using that as well. Does polysemy cause problems, e.g. the straw in strawberries isn't really the same as the general meaning of straw? Um, no, it actually doesn't because what we find is that we're not actually using, so we're never, we're never actually going to use the word straw, we're actually going to use straw and berries. So it's the thing I said about how it's bidirectional. So it's not just taking each word in its own, it doesn't consider each word by itself, it's looking at the whole sequence. And that's that's the thing I mentioned earlier about um, transformers using attention. So paying, looking at everything and choosing what to pay attention to as opposed to you know, looking at things in isolation. So CLS a proxy for the following words for faster pattern search. Um, it's not so much for pattern search as it is for downstream tasks. So the people who created BERTs had you know in mind that people are going to use it for classification um so and basically um 
to, to, to rewind, what, what, if they hadn't put the CLS token, what would happen is for each um, input token, so he eats strawberries, you would get a corresponding vector of say, you know, a vector that's like 768 long. Um, and if you then wanted to pass, pass all of this information to a classifier, you would then have to do some operations by yourself. The most popular thing that people do is to take the mean of all the inputs and smush it all together to make one vector and feed that to a classifier. So the creators of BERT said, well, we know people are used for classification, so we might as well use this first token, the CLS token, and people can just use that instead, instead of smushing everything up and doing the mean yourself. Does transfer learning apply to NLP as well? It actually does, and in the practical session, that's what we're going to do. We're going to take a pre-trained BERT model and apply it to the problem of spam detection. How, how, but does this tokenization handle the misspellings? It does not, unfortunately. Um, that will always give you out of vocabulary, vocabulary errors. Um, Jasper is asking, do CLS and CEP have to be used for all sequences or can one say only use certain sequences of classification? Um, unfortunately, no, which as you'll see in the um, practical session, when we are programming BERT, we actually have to provide the CLS and the, and the CEP tokens. Um, it doesn't, doesn't work without it. You didn't mention anything about case normalization or lemmatization, presumably because we want to treat those forms of words differently. Um, so there isn't any lemmatization done really. Um, with deep learning, you don't tend to need to do that. Um, you can do that, but you typically don't need to, especially not with um, when you're looking at word pieces. Um, that takes into like plurality and things like that into, into account. As for case normalization, you, you can, that's completely up to you. So. Um, like I said, we're going to use a pre-trained BERT model and transfer, do transfer learning on that. Um, and when we're picking our pre-trained BERT models, you can choose to use one that's had case normalization done to it, or you can choose one that hasn't. Um, so sometimes you get um, BERT on cased or BERT cased. One of them has case normalization, one of them doesn't. So that's completely up to you, to be honest. What is the limitation of BERT? I believe it is generally good for phrase or sentence text classification. We're not sure if it's effective for multiple sentences or a full document. <clears throat> so personally, I agree. And this, the CLS token is kind of like trying to do that. It's trying to give you a freebie for sentence classification or document classification. So it's saying, um, you know, this is a sentence, but you don't need to do anything. Just take the CLS token, the, the, the vector associated with the CLS token and use that for your sentence classification. And that works in some cases, but in other cases, you might have to come up with your own ways of pooling the outputs together to generate um, your own representations for the sequence classification. So it, I think it is possible as well, um, I would say. What happens if the sentence contains the reserved tokens? Say a sentence is trying to speak about these tokens. Uh, I don't know what you mean by reserved tokens, to be honest. Um, yeah, sorry. In, in the training data, what is the process for deciding the word piece embeddings? So the word piece embeddings are actually pre-built. Um, so it's kind of like, I guess, I don't know if you're familiar with things like Glove or um, word to vec you can kind of use off the shelf versions of word to vec and, and, and Glove. And the word piece embedder that's used in training the original BERT it was a pre-built one. Is padding not done for input sequences? Um, padding is actually done, um, as we'll see in the practical session. Um, the reason why we have to pad is, you know, we have to, with any language model, you know, is you have to specify a fixed length, um, and you know, your input texts aren't always going to be some length. Sometimes they'll be more than that. Sometimes they'll be shorter than that. Sometimes you have to truncate. Sometimes you have to pad. Um, Okay, so I'm going to move on to the practical session now. Um, so I, I'm not sure if everyone saw there was a GitHub link um, circulated that should, if we can all sort of go on GitHub and it should be here and just sort of download this code, um, just like click on this and download zip. Um, I'll just wait for some time for people to do that.
basically this is a repository that kind of contains the um, prerequisites, sort of the, the foundations for what we're going to build on. It has some a couple of helpers, and it has the skeleton for the BERT model we're going to build, um, as well as the toy data set that we're going to play with. It's a very small data set and just not really particularly useful. I think it really contains 500, potentially 500 examples. No, we have 1,000 examples, 500 of each class. Um, so not big at all. But it's just more to illustrate the process of like actually transfer learning on BERT. So what we're going to be doing is taking the whole BERT model that's already been pre-trained and then sort of choosing some layers that we want to freeze and some layers that we want to train and using that to build our own model. If I go back to the slides, it would probably correlate to this. So we're about to train these layers and freeze most of these layers is kind of the, the idea. That's what this is what we're going to do. Um, you know, you don't need a graphics card really. Um, I'm not even sure if my computer has a graphics card. Um, there is Python three would probably be 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 best. Someone's having problems installing on Windows. Um, I am currently on a Unix boot system, so I'm not really sure. Um, I mean, 1.14 definitely exists. I'm not sure why it can't find it. Um, Um, there is a slight, is there a difference? Someone's asking if there's a difference between encoding and embedding. Um, I guess the encoder is actually just creating embeddings. So really, not really. The autoencoder and the encoder is just really trying to create embeddings. Um, so yeah, I'm going, to, I'm going to start now. This is, if you've downloaded or cloned it, this is what you're going to get, um, you know, requirements this shows the I guess dependencies which we'll get to in a bit that's the data set Th these two are sort of helper features which I'll start by, by by going over and then this is what we're going to be building on um, so the first thing we need to is sort of set up our environment like I mentioned really we're looking at Python 3.6 and above um, and that's kind of like the main the biggest and pip is kind of the biggest um, dependencies really Let's see. Let's open that terminal window. For people not using PyCharm and IntelliJ, I think I'm going to um, kind of use a terminal window directly just so. Okay. Um, let's get the window right. Cool. So first, let's just create a virtual environment. <clears throat> you, you don't really have to do this, but it's nice to keep, you know, the requirements or the environments for each kind of project you have separate, just because some, maybe one project might require TensorFlow 1, another might require TensorFlow 2, that sort of thing. So it's just a handy thing to do. So that should have installed then, cool. Um, and now we're just going to switch into the virtual environment. Look, and now we're just going to run, install the requirements. Depending on, I guess, your setup or your operating system, you might have to do this as super user. So you might have to go to sudo dip install dash r requirements. TXT. Um, um, someone's asking for a larger font. I'm not actually sure how to do that. 
There you go. There you go. Okay, so that's done installing the, the requirements now. Um, so yeah, we'll start by talking about the um, helper, helper classes. Let's see if I can make the form bigger here as well. Again, not exactly sure how to do that. Yes. That kind of helps. Um, so yeah, basically, um, the first thing we need to do is create examples. So basically, an example is just like a wrapper um, class for each input. So I'll talk about the input example, and then I'll talk about the padding input example. So it's basically just, you know, it's a, an abstraction of inputs to BERT. So normally, you just have text, and this is going to put the text in an object that BERT's going to understand. So it takes in GUID, which is um, a just a unique identifier for for the, for the example. I'm saying no matching distribution for TensorFlow one point fourteen. I would suggest um, I'm not sure why Windows doesn't have TensorFlow one point fourteen because I think that's still publicly available. But yeah, might have to look into that. Um, yeah, so it takes in the GUID, which is just you know unique ID for the example, and it, it can, like I mentioned earlier in the um, um, presentation, you can both can actually take in two sequences if you're trying to do like a you know relation classification question answering. Um, so you can put in a text A and a text B and a label, um, or if you're just trying to do text classification, you can just put in a text A leave text B blank and your label. <clears throat> so text B is completely, um, it's completely optional. And these have to be untokenized, by the way, so it's just strings. So this is basically what an example of an input that would be fed to BERT. And then we have padding input example, which is basically just for padding. So everything is known. Yeah, so, um, uh, so yeah, someone else asked the question earlier, if we need to pad, we, we do need to pad, and this is kind of how we're going to do it. Um, so I've written a class called BERT Featureizer, and what this does is it uses BERT to kind of generate features, um, or it, it generates the features for BERT. Um, you'll see what we'll see what I mean about that in a minute. So to start off, it's just a constructor. It takes in <coughs> it takes in a path to a pre-trained BERT. It's so like I said, we're doing transfer learning here, so you know we already have an existing pretty large BERT model trained somewhere. And so we're going to pass that path in. Um, TensorFlow has this notion of sessions, um, so we're passing session as well, and in max sequence length. So that's, again, what I was saying earlier about padding, um, these things, you know, you have to specify a maximum sequence length, which is kind of like saying how many words do you think you will have in your data. So in each document for each text in your data, how many words do you think there'll be? Um, and so this is kind of like a heuristic. You know, you just kind of like think. If we're doing tweet classification, we could say, oh, well, you know, 140 characters, that means like you know, X amount of words. Or you could take, find, calculate the average um, sentence length for all sentences in your data set and use that. So there's no really, there's no real rule about how to do it. You just kind of like pick a number that you think is reasonable and, and use that. And so we basically just um, yeah, initialize all of these. So the main thing is the main thing in the constructor is initializing the tokenizer. So remember, I said we're going to be using a word word piece tokenizer. Um, so we actually get that that's bundled in with the pre-trained part, and we just um, so I've written this helper function that will actually create the tokenizer from the um, TensorFlow Hub module. So all this does really is just kind of like load in. Um, Loading tokenizer and store it really. So we store it away in that in that variable. Um, now this is kind of like where the, the interesting, this is where the fun is. So we've taken our simple text and labels and put them into examples. But remember that BERT actually takes in, you know, it does a bit of work to its inputs. So it does that thing where it um, appends CLS and set. Um, it does the word piece tokenization. But on top of that, 
it actually remember how I said it's a masked language model in terms of that some inputs are masked and some aren't. So it takes in input IDs and it takes in something called segment IDs and it takes in something called mask IDs. So this is this three. It turns the input into three kinds of different IDs. <coughs> so in the first instance, what we're, what we're going to do here is if it's a padding example, we just set everything to zero and re return the input IDs are going to be zero, the input mask is going to be zero, segment IDs are going to be zero, label also zero. So it's just kind of like padding nonsense. Um, just to go over what the input IDs really mean, it's kind of like a this is going to be an ID for if you think of the vocabulary as a dictionary, so say zero corresponds to the word um, I. Um, so zero is I, um, one is like, two is cats. And somewhere we have a dictionary that's saying that zero is the vector 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.9. So the ID is kind of like pointing to the vectors that are going to be inputs to the model. The mask is basically saying, this is what you should pay attention to. This is what you shouldn't pay attention to. Um, in in um, fine tuning, the mask is typically going to be zero. And segment IDs, remember how I said birth can take in multiple sequences. So segment IDs tell you which, which sequence the word belongs to. So if we had, for example, a sequence, something like, I like cats, and then set, and then I like hooks. The segment IDs for this would be zero. So zero, zero, zero. And the segment ID for this would be one, one, one. So it's trying to let her know that this is for this section and this is for this section. But because we're using, um, we're not doing, we're not using two pieces of text, we're just using the one text, the text A is kind of um, irrelevant. What do our segment IDs will be zero um, typically. So this is just, like I said, in the case, this is for the case of the padding example. Um, for the actual real examples that are in padding, um, we just kind of here we we generate we generate tokens, but you you can see that we're only we're going to minus two, and the reason for that is because we're trying to leave space for the CLS token and the and the and the, and the SEP token. So we tokenize everything, but we kind of like make sure that there's space on either end for the CLS and the and the SEP. And then we just add those on ourselves. So like I mentioned earlier, we do we do have to add it. And then we say that a segment ID is zero <clears throat> because you know we don't have more than one sentence. And then this is the important part. Like I said, um, tokenizer converts the tokens to ID. So you know you have a word and then it gives you an ID for that word. So zero is I, one is like, two is dog, that sort of thing. And then input mask one is basically saying that because you know how I said in training. Bert is trained with a masked um, language um, problem, so you hide some of the inputs. We're not actually doing that here because we're going to be using it um, for classification, so we're not hiding it. We're just actually going to set it to one, and then zero padding. In, in so we're seeing each the max length is sixty four, right? But not every sentence we encounter will be sixty four. So in that case, we want to pad. Um, otherwise, we want to truncate. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much it. That's kind of like how you um take your inputs from real text to but inputs so you um to go, go over the steps again you have to um generate your input ids mask ids and segment ids and when you're generating your input ids you have to make sure you leave space for the clf token in the beginning and the accept token at the end that's pretty much all there is to it and then you use the pre-built word piece tokenizer which you can get from tensorflow hub so yeah and these are just helper functions to take examples to features and text to examples. And then one final text to features. I don't know if anyone knows how to leave presentation mode. So now that we have a way to take our inputs from regular text that we understand to actual prepared inputs for BERTs, um, next, we're going to talk about the actual BERT layer itself. So the way I've set up is I've, I've subclassed in Keras, you know, I've subclassed the Keras layer to make a custom layer that's actually a BERT layer. So it can be reused in any sort of um, Keras program as a custom BERT layer. And to do that, we basically just have to subclass or overwrite three methods, which is the build method, the call method, and the, oh, sorry, I should, Maybe it's full screen. 
so yeah, I'm saying we have to start class three methods, the build method, which is basically saying, how do we set up this layer? You're telling Keras, this is, this is how you want the layer to look, the architecture of it, and kind of like all the setup really. Um, call is basically saying, how is this layer used? This custom layer they're making, how is it going to be used? And output shape is telling um, Keras what dimensions, what the output shape to expect should be. And that's kind of all you really need to create your own Keras layer. Um, so we're going to use that to create our own vert layer. So the create a customer a constructor that takes in the number of layers we want to fine tune. This is this is where the transfer learning comes in. So we can choose to fine tune as many layers as we want. Remember that it has but has seventy two layers. Here we're just taking um, we're just fine tuning the last ten layers um, and keeping the remaining sixty two as is. And then you point it to a path to the vert that you want to use. Um, actually, I'm just going to quick, um, what's the word, tangent, show you guys um, TensorFlow Hub real quick. So this is kind of where you can find a lot of pre-trained models um, for different, different, like really different problems. Um, so we've also got text domain problems, for everything from question information retrieval, classification, question answering, to image, image problems, video, audio. So these are all pre-built models that if you want to do transfer learning on, you could, um, but actually lives, because Bert is de developed by Google AI, it actually lives in here. Um, so yeah, they've also got other models, obviously. Um, and they kind of like update Bert quite frequently. So that was, it was last updated, I think Friday? No, today even. So um, yeah, there's always um, new Bert. So they kind of like add newer sizes. So this this is the Bert we're actually using. Um, but there's actually larger ones that would probably give um, better classification, but we heavier and um, larger to store, slower to train. But you also have lightweight BERT models, same way to like use this for mobile. Um, you know, you can sort of choose the ones that you want and go from there. So that's kind of where we're actually getting our BERTs from. So uh, you just pass in the path to the model that you want and. Notice someone asked earlier about, you know, whether case normalization is, you, you need to do that. So you specifically don't need to do it because if you choose the right BERT model, then, you know, it depends on the BERT model you choose. So if, if I'm using uncased, then that means, you know, I might as well do it myself. I'm using case, I don't have to. So back to the constructor, we basically just, um, yeah, uh, assign fill up our instance variables um, Output size is 768, which I talked about. I mentioned in the talk. Um, this is the path we're going to use, and then we just call the super constructor. So the this is going to call the actual Keras layer that layer constructor. So let's go with build. This is kind of where the, the meat of the transfer layer transfer learning action is. Um, the first thing we do is we initialize our BERT by calling TensorFlow Hub and requesting that we want you know. We want pre-trained birds. So, and all you need to do really is pass the path, and that's it really. And these are optional. This is just a name, and this um, tells you if it's trainable. So, once we do this, we now have in this variable we have the birds that's been trained on, you know, however million messages and has 110 million trainable parameters. But we don't want to use all of the layers because we're doing transfer learning, and we only want to say train the last five, in this case, the last 10, but you know, the last n layers. So what we do here is we, these, we, we get all of the variables in, contained in BERTs. That's, these are the trainable variables, the 110 million parameters. And then we say, if it doesn't have CLS, then we're taking it. So the CLS tokens are for classification and we don't, we don't want to touch that because that's already been built in. We don't want to, we don't want to have to do that by ourselves. We want to use the, you know, existing CLS. So we're going to exclude that from a new trainable virus. So we don't, we're not going to be training that, we're going to leave that as is. And the next one to select which layers we're going to train. So basically, like I mentioned earlier, we're training the bottom. So if you think of it as layer one, layer two, layer three, layer seven, layer 72, we want to train only the last 10 layers because these layers are general features and the final layers are more specific features. So we want to keep the general features, you know, things that understand like negation or positive and negative, or you know, the general, general, general features of language, the like building blocks, the basics of language. 
Bert already has that in here. We don't want to touch that. What we want to touch the specifics and make it specific to our problem. So we're just going to train the last 10. And 10 isn't, you know, it's not a hard rule. Like I showed in that quadrant picture, you sort of, you know, you have to find the sweet, sweet spots between general and specific. So, and it depends on the size of your data set and, you know, similarity of your problem to the, to the original problem. So like I said, um, we're just going to take um, the last 10 and say that those are our trainable variables. And we basically just kind of, um, yeah, set up our trainable weights and say that these are the things that we want to train. You know, we update trainable weights with the contents of trainable bars and do the same for non-trainable. So we're basically saying, this is what we want to train. This is what we don't want to train. And that's kind of what transfer learning is. We're saying we're retraining this, we're leaving this as is. And then once we finish doing that, we call um, the parent classes um, build method, just so it does all the things that Keras needs to do. So this is kind of like the Keras specific stuff and this kind of our bird specific stuff up here. So yeah, that's basically, that's all you need to do to sort of set up your free tr your transfer learning birds. And now we need to actually set up how, what it actually does, when you call it, what will happen? How do you, when you use it, how do you use it? So first thing we do is cast the inputs to an int in 32, and then generate the IDs, input IDs, mask IDs, and segment IDs like we did before. Um, and then we put that in a dictionary saying that this is the name, input IDs, input mask, input mask, segment IDs, segment IDs, and then just apply births to it. So, you know, just like I said, we already loaded births. So the bird contains the bird that we um, um, loaded from TensorFlow Hub. So this is a pre-trained one. And we just run the pre-trained birds with our inputs. That's really it. So we're basically just, it's, it's kind of like taking a serialized file and just calling a function on it. The only thing we really had to do was select what we want to train, what we don't want to train. And that's pretty much it. So now we're going to... Now we need to actually um, get our hands dirty building building our own. So that model. This should already have all the um, imports that we're, we're going to need. Um, and we're just going to sort of add to it. So you should already have installed the requirements. Hopefully it's worked for everyone by now. Um, so the first thing we do is create a BERT class. Subclass objects and create a constructor for it. Once send it the path. This is basically saying, um, you know, this is the bird that we want to use. Um, max. System. Um, set that 64 again. And the number of layers we want to change. And so the first thing we, we just want to set up these um, instance variables that we're going to use later. Um, I noticed in the Q and A in the chat that, that a lot of people used to seem to use different, um, a lot of different programming environments. So be curious after to hear about, I guess, reasons why people use. Um, different things. So I used to use Atom, but since I found PyCharm, I honestly haven't looked back. So this is basically just setting up the, oh, I missed, I missed one. So now we just want to give our Class of session, a tensorflow session. Um, and so this is session is going to be used um, throughout the life, the life cycle, the lifetime of this, this class. And as well, our featureizer, which is basically just a helper that turns raw text that we're giving into um, inputs for that. Give it a path that we wanted to use. 
How you doing? Su super quick one, man. Could I get you to just pop that back in presentation mode? Just so that... Yeah, sorry. I keep forgetting to do that. Thanks, mate. All right, let's, let's read that one. Session. This is basically going to be what we use to turn our text into vert inputs. And then, yeah. So next we need to kind of, I guess, build the model. Um, the first thing we need to do when we're building a model is initialize the inputs. So, and what, what do I mean by that? Um, this is in terms of Keras, um, we need to, if you're familiar with like TensorFlow 1, you sort of have to um, sort of specify placeholder variables for your input variables. Um, and that's kind of a similar thing in Keras as well. So that's kind of what we're going to do now. Just saying, if we want to we want to specify an input, um, the shape going to be. So these are the um, you've seen the arguments that it takes, but we're only going to use the shape and the name. That's kind of what we need for now. It's just a placeholder. It doesn't actually contain anything yet. So the shape is going to be because we're saying this is the inputs input IDs. So remember the IDs are like corresponding to the words the word tokens. So it's going to be the length of the sequence. So if you know if we're saying we're having it's basically going to be a um, max sequence length. So we're saying we're going to have a maximum of 64 um, inputs. So the shape is going to be self dot max sequence length. Um, this is not right. Okay, and then the name. Gonna call it by these because that's what it is. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we're now just going to do the same, um, like I said, with the masks and the segments. So, just go, it's going to be the same shape, it has to be, it has to match up. And now we put that all together into one variable called for inputs. That's basically just your input ID. Marks. That's it. That's, we've set up the inputs. Now the next thing we need to do is um, set the actual architecture to connect connect the layers together. How, how, how is the model going to look? The model that we're like um, transfer learning, how is it going to look? It's basically going to be, like I said um, earlier, it's going to be a BERT that we've, fr we, we've frozen some of his layers and we're going to retrain some of his layers and then connect that to a linear classifier. In our case, we're going to connect that to a fully connected um, neural network. And then, so the BERT will do the feature extraction, we connect the BERT to outputs, to a neural network and that will do the classification and then we get our outputs. <clears throat> so let's do that now. First, first things first, we need to get the outputs from BERT. We need to now use our BERT layer that we made before, which is you know a subclass of Keras layer. So this is why it is it, it's going to play nice with the Keras here. How many layers we want to fine tune? Say I think the other um, things have good defaults. So that's what we've already got the path that we're going to use. So we don't need to do anything with that. And then, so this will create a layer and then we just call So we just create that layer and we let it know that this is what it's going to get. It's going to get all of, all of these which are in here. 
And so now this is going to give us the output from BERT, which is going to be 768, um, I don't know how to describe it. So it's, it's basically just going to be a bunch of um, vectors like this, where actually it's going to be more like CLS. So the, it'll be a vector for CLS, a vector for I, and a vector for like, and a vector for that. So this would be 768 long, this would be 768 long, this would be 768 long, etc. cetera. Um, and then, so it's going to be a matrix of 768 by, um, I guess, mark sequence length, which is 64. Uh, so that's going to be our output. And we just, just I guess, just so everyone knows. Um, but to be fair, I forgot to mention this. This is the so this is what I was talking about earlier about what CLS is actually used for, and what that question that was asking about um, document classification or, or you know, phrase classification. So this is actually Bert's output, right? So it's going to be. Oh, sorry, forgot to mention four because we have four things here. So it's going to be a matrix this size. Now, really, this is a lot. Um, is we want a way to pull all this information into one vector. And one thing, one way we can do that is we can take the mean of each of these. So, and that would then give us something that's you know, 768 by 64. If we just take the mean across across this dimension, um, but instead of doing that, we could also just take what's the the 768 from from here and. It's kind of what we do. So we, instead of like having to calculate the mean of all of these, we just take this one and we're done with it. And that's what we're going to do here. So per output is just going to be the value in CLS, in the CLS position. And then, so now that we've gotten <coughs> our output from BERT, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Now that we've gotten our output from BERT, we just need to connect it to a classifier. So we're just going to make it dense, you know, just a regular vanilla neural network, nothing. We're just, I'm just going to put, you know, neural network two hundred fifty six neurons in it. Um, ReLU activation. That's going to take in both outputs. Um, and then now we're just going to put a um, what's the word output output there. Try and draw a diagram, and I'm not sure if you can do that on Zoom, but I think you might be able to. That might hopefully explain this a little bit in a picture form. This is going to take the previous inputs. I'm just going to let's see if I can actually draw. Uh, I might not be able to. Okay, well, in feeling that we can get creative. It's going to take a while. So if we say this is bad. This is a um, kind of the first layer, which is going to be BERT. And this is going to give us kind of this. We then feed the outputs, which is going to be one vector. So we have BERT here, and that gives us an output of this. We then feed this again to I'm not really sure how to annotate on Zoom, so I'm just going to have to go on um, text and drawing. So 
So this is our BERT layer will give us, this is our BERT layer that will give us some, some output, which is going to be what, some vector that we, we see will correspond to the CLS token. We then feed that to a fully connected layer. This is just another layer, that's just a neural network. And that will give us something that we then feed to the output layer, which is just a classic neural network. And this is our output. Okay. Yes. This is basically, this is visually what this is saying um, down here. So, per output, dense, pred. Per output, into dense, into pred, gives us our answer. Um, so, into copy this. Just for, I oh don't know, that's butchered it. Okay, well, I guess that's done. Hopefully, that makes sense. Um, now we're just going to put it all together. So we've specified the inputs and we've, from the inputs, specified the architecture of the model, the layers, what goes into what, and now we just need to put that into a model, into a Keras model. Yeah, just input it takes, but inputs. Oh, it's going to be. So it's going to be like the final thing in the diagram I showed you, just going to be the thing that gives you the yes or no. And then our model. So tell it what loss, what loss function we want to use. Um, we need to use the classic cross, cross entropy. Um, you can use others that you want, but specifically binary cross entropy because we're using, um, like I said, we're using a spam data set. So the classes are binary, so it's one or zero to the spam, it's not spam. Um, if it was multiple, then you'd probably want to use categorical um, cross entropy. Did I spell that right? I think so. Um, again, you have your choice of um, optimizer. So you can use Adam, you can use um, RMS. Um, I think they use Adam. I think most papers tend to do that. And do this. The model of summary will print out. Um, or will print out. Do what it says. It print out the summary of the model, kind of like telling you. You know how many trainable parameters. You know how many, what the outputs are going to look like. It's kind of handy, especially for debugging. But in practice, you typically don't need it. But yeah, that will give us a model. Um, so we've got a way of creating a model. Now let's go back to our constructor and do this. Equals to and. Next, we want to, all this has done really is build the, set up the model and say, this is, these are the inputs, this is what the model should look like, this is what it should take in, this is what it should take out. We actually haven't done any training, any fitting of the model. Um, so we can do that now. We need to create a fit function. I believe that's what um, sklearn and most, um, that's the signature that most sort of libraries use. Um, it's going to take in, Text, it's going to take in labels. So this is kind of like your X and this is kind of your Y. This is, yeah, your text and your labels. Um, and just ratio. Um, this is basically saying how much of the training set we want to use for validation when we're training. And I'm going to say 90% for training, 10% for validation, because we don't have actually have that much training data anyway. And so the first thing we're going to do is divide it into um, train, train and validation splits. If, you know, if we're doing it properly, we'd probably potentially maybe want to have a, think of some way of dividing it into train and test splits as well. But maybe that would happen outside this function. That's um, neither here nor there. It's completely up to the individual. So 
So what this is basically saying is we're going to say however many texts we have, give me 10% of that. And from the beginning to the 10, just give me the first 10%. And that's one way to use my validation text. Um, and then for, for train text, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to say we want from, from the 10th percent downwards, so from the remaining 90%, that's going to be a train. And similarly for labels, to be honest. That's, that's pretty much that for our train and validation splits. Next, we want to remember these are just text and labels. And remember that um, BERT, as we know, takes in things as in the form of input IDs, segment IDs, and input masks. So we need to turn this into that. And we've already created the helper function that I showed earlier in BERT Featureizer that does that for us. So we can just use that. And we already instantiated it that featureizer in this in this um, constructor, so it's just going to be a matter of using that really. It's just saying featureizer. So yeah, we want to take it directly from text to features. Uh, I'm going to pass in the text. In the and this is going to give us, it's going to return. This is going to take our training data and create a list. What's that? Okay. It's going to create a list of IDs corresponding. It's going to take this list of train texts and create this train into IDs, train into masks, and train segment IDs. Um, and now we're going to do the same again for the validation. Right, now we have our uh, inputs. Now we can actually train. So we've already, um, remember we've built, set up the model. We had this one set up the model and we set it all up and put it in this instance variable called self the model. So that means once we've created our inputs, all we have to, have to do is actually just call it on the model. So we can call the fit model, which is the fit method, which is provided by Ferris. Um, pass it in. Let me show you the arguments. It's not doing that now, it's not playing nice. Well, the first thing you need to pass in is the, uh, you just need to pass in the train, training input and training labels. And then optionally, you can pass in the validation data, which we do have and it is passing. So remember the inputs look like this. Um, so it's an array, you can buy these mask and segments, and that's exactly what we're going to do here. And now we do the labels. And optionally, the validation label, which we do have. Uh, and this, but instead of the validation. Um, 
else. We can also um, <clears throat> tell it how many epochs we want to train for. Um, for those unfamiliar, the first base epochs is basically saying how many times you want the model. To... So we typically train neural networks in batches. So we take, you know, we, we have a data set. Say we have 1,000 texts and labels. We take batches of, say, 32. And we feed 32 into the model, calculate a lot to do our training, feed the next those two, feed the next those two. And we do that until we exhaust all of our data. Once you've done that, that's one epoch. Um, and then you can specify how many times you want to go through your data sets. Um, I'm just going to, I guess, just for, let's just say three or two, even, it doesn't have to be a lot. It's just a demonstration. The actual number you will use there depends on the amount of data you have. The complexity of your model and how many resources you have because you know there's no point in putting 50 epochs trying to train a really deep model on you know a laptop with that can't really handle it and that ends up taking like months so you know it's a bunch of things you have to consider um yeah so like i mentioned you know it's trained in batches so you also have to specify a batch size um, um batch size is a is, these things, batch size is something called a hyperparameter as well. Um, hyperparameters are sort of settings. So hyperparameters are settings that you put into your neural network that kind of affect your performance and you kind of want to like optimize them pretty much all of the time. You want to choose the most optimal hyperparameters. And so, you know, the simplest way of doing that is trial and error. So just try a bunch of things and see what gives you the best results. That's kind of called grid search. And you can, there's a bunch of papers around different ways of doing that. So you could use something called particle swarm optimization. I'm not experienced to that, but um, I've got a paper on that I can share um, if anyone's interested later. Um, but batch size is another hyperparameter. And when choosing your batch size, you have to think about what I like to think about in a way is the class spread of my data. So this is what I mean. So remember, the model is being trained on, on in batches. So let's say this is the data, right? One. So we've got these nine, I mean, 10. This is our data set. It's got 10 things in it. And we say we have a batch size of one, for example. If all it sees is this one, if all the model sees in that training step is one, it doesn't see any zeros. It's just going to learn that whenever you give an example, say one, and it's going to get here, it's going to say zero, C zero. It's going to understand what that means. It's probably just going to say one. So you have to think about that. So if we choose a batch size of say four, the first time you'll see three ones and one zero. And okay, you'll probably see most of the time things are one. The next time you'll see mostly zeros and one one. It's going to be like, what's going on? That's going to be confusing. And then the next time it's probably going to, well, it's just going to see this, it's, it's nothing, one or zero. So you, you can kind of choose your batch size based on the amount of ones and zeros, basically the amount of your, your class splits. If your class is split 50-50, you don't really have to think much about it. But if you, you know, when you have unbalanced data that's like 90-10 and you end up, what you will end up with sometimes is like, if you choose, you know, it's small enough, if you choose a batch size that's too small, what you end up seeing is that, that batch, each batch will only have like, you know, one of the minority class and the rest of the batch will be the majority class, which is typically not what you want. So um, just be mindful of that uh, when you're choosing batch sizes. Here, like I said, the data is literally um, artificially balanced. It's perfectly balanced, 500 spam, 500 ham. Um, so we don't really have to think about it too much here, but just something to keep in mind. And this is really it. This is all you need to do to um, fit the trainer model, we just call, we convert our inputs to a but input, and then we call the fit model and the fit method on it. And just leave that for now. Um, yeah, so we're using sessions, so we just need to quickly, before we start anything, we need to initialize the session, I believe. Um, call that. Okay. Just take a session. Yeah, it takes in the session.
this is um, like TensorPlay, TensorFlow boilerplate stuff. Um, it's basically just um, all we're going to be doing here is initializing all of the, the variables that we're going to be using. Um, it's just something you need to do in TensorFlow. It's just, um, yeah. I'm going to initialize the local variables, the global variables as well, and tables. So session that should be it really. Uh, oh. All right, so now we're just going to let's actually use it, use our new class. Um, so first things first, we want to a session. So I'm just going to quickly get just going to get the path to the um that model so we can feed that in somewhere. Yeah, and now I set up um defaults, but I just also like to be paranoid and make sure I'm putting in the right things. Which I know seems kind of intuitive. So this is just basically going to initialize our thing on, on birds, giving it, telling her this is the way she get the free train model from. And now I included in the repo a CSV file that we're going to use as a data set. So we're just going to load, load that with um, this. What it's called? It's called spam based set. And now we just want to get the text. Um, so if we, I'm just going to show everyone what the data set looks like really quickly. Um, can everyone still see my screen? Okay. Um, so it's got these these two columns, um, just text and label, and it kind of just looks like this. It's, um, text and zero if it's not spam. One if one if it's a spammy one, a spammy message, so things like basically you know everyone knows what spam is. It's just like trying to get you to do something, find you this money. Um, so yeah, actually there's 500 rows. That means there's 250 of each class. So it's actually like I said, a very very small data set. Um, yeah. Let's come back here. And now that we know what that. Called, we can just use that. And so data, and then. I'm 
it should really just fit it. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Now we just have to run it. Save that, come back here. So what we're actually going to find when you run this, um, you'll probably get stuck at some point potentially. Um, gone wrong. You'll probably get stuck potentially um, trying to download your, because if you've not done this before, then you probably won't have the pre-trained bot on your locally on your local machine. So you'll probably install somewhere somewhere here, trying to download it. Um, so if you just run it and let it download. Um, well, that's what I'm going to try and keep up this. That's kind of Um, boy. So yeah, we're trying. To, I was trying to pass in um, an actual function instead of into the list. Okay, let's um, so I'm, I'm going to assume that our um, birds are still downloading, but while that's happening, we'll just run this again. <coughs> okay. So you're many labels to unpack, 155. Um, What's going on here? Um, so I forgot. Um, so what we've actually seen here is that we're not self defeaturizing the convert text to features. It actually returns the labels as well. So we need to do that. We need to add that so that it basically this re returns the top of all this one, two, three, four, four long. And before we had it, it was three, but it's expecting four. So we need to add that. Um, crap, I made a mistake actually. I just realized something. Um, this should be valid labels, not train labels. So it's the same thing the model we get. So I saw the error message is saying. Let's Okay, so found 450 input samples and 50 target samples. That was strange. But probably because of that, we can fix them. There we go. So now it's training. Um, but while it's training, so it's only POC 1. Let's um, quickly look at this. So remember, I had model the summary. So this is kind of a nice summary of the model. Um, you can see that it's, it's kind of what we, what we fed it. So the shape here, which is the max length, is 64. 
none is if they saw the this this is going to be whatever a batch size is that's what none is going to be so in our case it's going to be 32. Um, so yeah th these are the these are the inputs um, and then we then have a vert layer which is which like I said gives us 768 which is the correspond which corresponds to the output of the CLS CLS token so that's 768 that remember in this presentation in the slides I said standard vert has 110 million Trimble parameters, so that's, that's what we're seeing here. Um, and then we then have our dense network, which is the 2561, this next one. And then we have our output layer. Um, and if you notice, yeah, it says total params um, 110, actually trainable six. So this is the whole idea of um, transfer learning. We know that it has 110 million trainable parameters. We don't want to retrain all of those because I, mean, I personally, my computer does not have. It would take ages to do that and a lot of money. Um, so I'm just going to return six and still get decent results. So it's kind of like standing on the shoulders of giants, kind of learning. Um, so yeah, training is done. Um, we've got final validation accuracy of 0.82. Um, yeah, so just to, I guess, try and test that. Um, first of all, I'm just going to pause for a quick QA just to see how everyone else is getting if your births have downloaded. Um, Find the QA function here. Um, so, Alex is saying BERT is mostly downloadable for English text. What's the best approach to use it for foreign languages of German or French? Um, I, hmm, I'm pretty sure there's BERT for foreign languages. Um, okay, so Google, I don't know what it said here because it's like Chinese. Um, I think it is. Um, so, let's just um, I'm sorry, can everyone, hopefully everyone's still see my screen. Um, so yeah, this is Bert based German. So yeah, yes, you can find people have made their own kind of um, but models that you can find and build on. So this is the same one as ours, 12 layers, 768, 110 million parameters, but specifically um, in German. So you, you can, um, yeah. Um, so it says, what loss function do you suggest for multi-class classification? Um, categorical cross-entropy is the one for that. So it's in the sense that, you know, it's not, it's not binary, it's more than one. How could you change the code if you, if for instance, you want to use a completely new data set for training? Um, well, the code basically is kind of generic in the sense that all you need to give it is a text and labels. So the only thing you would need to change really is, is this, this part. All you need to do is use your own data set and get text and labels by yourself. Um, and this is all you need to do is get your own text, get your labels, and then you just feed it in. So these, these are the only two lines you really have to change. You would have to do the data rounding to get your text and your labels to that format. Someone says still downloading is very large. Sorry, I probably should have had you download it from the start. But yeah. And I will I will update the repo to have the completed but model.py um, with comments as well. So people can go back to follow along. Um, someone says that model.py line 60 in bit does not have model. Um, I don't know what done there because my line 60 isn't doesn't say that my line 60 says something else. Um, we, I would I would I would say um, the person who asked that I would say that maybe you're potentially this self the model and you're not actually you haven't returned model here or something. Maybe you're not using a Keras model. And it, yeah, that's probably my suggestion. Um, I don't see any progress getting warnings. Oh, when you don't see any progress and you get warnings, that's you're still downloading. Just um, like I said, it, it takes a while to download all of all of it. Just wondering why this now be using TFP one, not TFP two, um, because I'm most familiar with TF one, and I think it's honestly um, kind of easier to learn because you can see everything step by step. Whereas TF V two kind of does away with lazy evaluation and makes it more like programming code, whereas this sort of makes it you know layers and you can you can visualize the network. Um, in production, probably would or should use TF2, to be honest. 
um, get the crew to the end of the session. Yeah, I'll add the crew to fire. Um, you should go to the end again. Input size error. Um, well, yeah, sure, the code could be that. That helps. Um, yeah, hopefully everyone's but has downloaded and has trained successfully. Um, installation code in the chat. Um, we'll put that for Julia. Let's figure out how to reach the chat. I'm not sure if I can put it in the chat, but it's basically going to be for Julia, who's asked, whoever's asking about the installation, installation code, I'm going to screen do this. We just put into, wait, that's not what I'm going to do. So, Josh on. And you just have to make sure you're running this from the DSF Deepbox 2020 um, directory. So you're living in that directory and then you while in that directory, you run this. Um, if it still doesn't work, I would recommend doing this. Um, and that, that, should, that should help it work. You, you kind of get some issues with um, some versions of Mac OS and, and, and sudo and pip well, on the whole. So I'm just going to add one more, one last bit. So we've trained the model. This is all good. We can actually build the model, but like let's actually try and use it. Um, so I'm going to make a model, add a method that we can call. Um, someone wants a break at 10 30. Um, yeah, um, to be honest, let's do that. We've only got like five at the end of it. So I'm going to let's take a little break and then hopefully everyone's birth will have downloaded and we can come back and finish up by just I'm going to create a model a function that's going to predict um, a label giving an input example. So we would have trained and now this is going to be for using the model. So for any new text, it should tell us whether it's spam or whether it's not spam. Okay. So I'm just going to pause here and just yeah wait for about a couple of minutes while people take a little break. Thanks so far, Dua. Uh, mate, going really, really good and firing through the questions and stuff. So uh, looking very good from this end. So thank you very much. And yeah, it may be, as you say, if we come back in literally two minutes, it will just give people time to nip to the toilet or get a cup of tea or whatever. Someone's asking to cut and paste the code. Honestly, I'm not sure if that won't work, but I'll give it a go. I don't know how the indentation is going to, you know, go in the Zoom in the Zoom text box, but I'll give it a go. I don't know, it's not letting me do it, sorry. That's weird. Um, someone asked what would be different in TensorFlow V2. Well, probably you wouldn't have to do this. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not actually sure, but I think this k set session wouldn't exist in, in TensorFlow 2. And this, I believe, would be the same as well. Um, what else wouldn't be the same? So um, tf.session, where is it? Um, whenever we use tf.session, basically we would have to use tf.compact.v1 in the session. That's another thing you'd have to change. Um, and that's kind of the reason for all these warnings that you're seeing. So,
All right, so people are asking to commit as it is. I'll do that really quickly. So I should have updated it. All right, so you should have the um, updated one now. I'm just going to add the link to the repo again in the chat. Just people who joined late. All right, so that's been five minutes. I'm going to start again. Um, we... Okay, so like I said, we've built the model, we can train it. And now we just want to be able to run predictions, um, which is, you know, kind of ultimately what we would want to do with any model. So let's do that. Let's drop down. This is going to give us a probability of um, spam. Let's give it um, X. X just being the input. And so all we need to do, actually, I mean, this might be quite a bit too vague. Let's call it text. Um, so all we need to do is, you know, the same thing as we did before. With any given text, we have to featureize it or vertize it, put it in a way that Burst can understand. So info IDs, um, info masks, segment IDs. Um, and that's just going to be this. And labels obviously is not going to use because it's a test example and the label doesn't come, but so that would just be empty. Text and we give it you know, for the labels because, like I said, you know, we don't know the label, that's the point we're trying to predict. Um, so it hasn't been seen before. Um, yeah. Where's this red line coming from? Indentation is off, is it? Hmm. That seems right to me. Oh, what's, the, what's happened here? Um, That's better. Um, so yeah, we've put it into um, our inputs now, and now we just have to run the model on it. Uh, yeah, this just takes. Out. You can. So here we're supposed, we're going to put in an array. Um, if we're going to be clever, we could probably have some conditionals that. You know, check whether the input is a single text or if it's a list of texts, because model that predicts Keras's model that predicts can actually take in both of those, um, or it takes in an array, actually, not both. So it always takes in multiples. Um, but for this dummy with five 
minute example, which is going to make it always take one. And then you can also pass in a batch size if you know the events that you're passing in an array if you want, and you don't want to do everything in one big go. Um, but like I said, we're just doing this because it's quick, quick, and, quick and easy. Um, so we're going to train it all over again, which is obviously not recommended. Ideally, you would probably save it, save the model. Um, my bad door. Let's just call prediction on, you know, um, printer as well. So that's kind of like the spammiest message I could think of. Um, and hopefully it will give us 0.5 and above. But like I said, this is just a dummy example. This is kind of like the, um, basically just the foundation of it. So the data set is incredibly tiny, 250, 250. That's not really a real data set, it's a toy data set. But this is just to demonstrate how you would build the model and pr print or how you would build the model and predict. Um, it's kind of like here. So like I said, this is going to train all over again. If you wanted to, ideally after you trained, you would probably serialize your model. So you would save your model to file um, and Keras has helper functions for doing that. I think you would call model.save or some things is, might actually be as easy as that. Um, but that's, there's obviously different ways of serializing your model and that's kind of uh, to everyone's um, preference really. But I think Keras models are typically in um, H5 formats, H5 files, but you can also store them in other ways as well. Probably pickle them, you can use choplib, you know. Although I wouldn't recommend, recommend pickling because pickling is, um, quite unsafe from a security point of view. Again, with a small data set like this, I would probably um, potentially use more, more than two epochs because we can. Um, but just for the for the um, purpose of time, two or two, two should two, two should do because we're still getting a validation accuracy of 0.8. Um, and so it's finished. So it's given us the probability of spam and it's saying that this this 0.78 or 78% confident that free 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 sexy one pound is a spam message, which it is so you know in very few lines very simple lines of code we've managed to build you know a spam detector that built on but um so that's pretty much it i'm going to um commit this code to the github link that was shared um at the start of the, the session so if people want you can just like um yeah collect that code and yeah like i mentioned earlier the only thing you really have to change is this um, and you just put your own text and put your own labels and you can use that to train. Um, and then you can also use it to predict in the same way. So kind of got everything you need in here really. Um, yeah, we us speak one more round of questions, see if there's anything new. Well, just someone asking how to save the current model. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but let's go ask um, Stack Overflow. So yeah, it was right model that save. Um, so it's really as easy as that. Um, yeah. So what you would do is you would come here and say, um, yeah, once you've done it all of this, you would just say something like my bad. Yeah, actually create a function in here. So this is the what we would use. Um, a bit of a path. 
that's it really and then come here and say my birthday so Um, to load, I imagine it probably be something similar. Um, yeah, character model to load model. So yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Um, you ready for me to come back and do it, or are you going to tackle those last couple of questions? Or well, that's that's kind of us. Hey, we've, we've got through what forty six questions. <laughs> so, uh, it's pretty pretty good. Pretty good going, man. So um, I think just you know wrap, wrapping stuff up for, from from our end. Uh, put, putting together a workshop like this, it, it takes a lot of time and effort um, and we really, really do appreciate it, you know, personally and also as a community. Um, you know, I, I know how hard you'll have worked to, to be able to put, to, put to today's session uh, together. So thank you very much uh, to you personally. Uh, and also thank you very much to the Depop. Um, you, you've been great partners for us this year. Uh, it's been a, been a tough year. Um, and to be delivering an online festival and being able to put together the type of events we have, uh, we really appreciate it, mate. So um, I guess, as I say, there's been a few questions. Uh, we did share your Twitter handle, I think, and your LinkedIn profile and stuff uh, at the very beginning. So ho hopefully you're happy for you know, people to follow yeah. up and connect so, with you directly, man. So um, yeah, th thank you very much. And um, yeah, is there any, any final, final points from you? And then we'll, we'll wrap things up uh, for this morning. Um, yeah, no, that's pretty much it. Um, just one last thing, I guess, would be a shameless plug that at Depop we're hiring for junior data scientists. So okay. if people are feeling like that, you're you know, welcome to apply. Please, please do, everyone, because uh, as I say, obviously, uh, I know I do well now, and uh, I know quite a few of the other guys at, uh, at Depop, and uh, they've got a really good team there, and uh, you know, their approach to what they're working on and stuff like that is. Uh, very, very much, you know, second to none. So do do follow up with Depop 100%. So, uh, well, thank you all very much uh, for, for joining us. I hope you've in, uh, enjoyed the session. Uh, please do obviously check out the other upcoming events. We've got two more Saturday morning workshops to come. Uh, we've got a couple of panel discuss discussions uh, to go. Uh, and finally, we do also have um, a, a movie night, uh, which we've got planned for, for the tail end of the month as well. So uh, join things to a close uh, one final time. Thank you very much, Adua. Uh, thank you all for joining uh, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.